Welcome to the Good Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Curtis Chang. The Good Faith Podcast is a production of Redeeming Babel, and it's where friends who follow Jesus help each other make sense of the world. And joining me today is not just any friend, it's founding friend, David French. <laughs> Welcome, David. David, as you all know, is co-founder of the original Good Faith Podcast and a columnist at the New York Times. Welcome, David. Well, it's great to be back. And I love that founding friend. Um, that's going to be yeah. on your epitaph. You know, that's, I appreciate that's, that. <laughs> um, well, I am always excited to welcome founding friend David French back, but I am especially excited today because for the, today's topic, I literally cannot think of anybody else I would rather have this discussion with on this topic. Should I stay or should I go the GOP version. Um, now, David, I could not get the rights to the song, Should I Stay or Should I Go, the, from The Clash. Uh, <laughs> Stranger Things season two apparently had snapped up the rights to that song. But I think it's fair to say that we own the concept, at least when it's applied into the Christian world. Because David, remember we had this conversation before about should I stay or should I go? Mm -hmm. And that conversation uh, was really done with people thinking about, should I stay or should I go the, the church, especially the evangelical church, right? And what I want to set up is this version for the GOP, for those who are wrestling with this question as Republicans. And here's what it, it, why this question came up for me, David. Um, so I was at a recent gathering. This is the second of two, two gatherings now we've had organized by the Johns Hopkins University and the R Street Institute. The title of this two set convenings was a conservative agenda to protect democracy, a conservative agenda to protect democracy. The participants were all what you would call classic conservatives or, and pro liberal democracy, lowercase l liberal democracy. Many of right. them actually were Christians and quite a few of those were good faith listeners. So that was really fun. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yeah, they were, and all, most of them, all, not uh, practically all of them, fans of David French. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. Practically all? So. <laughs> oh, well, you want, do you want 100% saturation? Uh, no, no, I'm just, I, I'm just uh, curious as to there were there, were there notable, like, opponents? <laughs> <laughs> no, no notable opponents, but I just, I did not survey every single person <laughs> okay, and say, okay. are you a fan of David French or not? I'm sure fair, you would get it. <laughs> your approval ratings were, are going to be very high through the roof in I, that crowd. <laughs> the, the phrase practically all was pregnant with uh, hidden meaning. Uh, <laughs> oh, right. No, okay. No, no, no. I'm just trying to, you know, be completely accurate here in my <laughs> phrasing. Um, all right. So, so again, here's the key. Almost all of them, I would say, if not all of them, were still members of the Republican Party, except me. Uh, so we're talking about people. And these are, you know, there was a governor of a, a state governor there, lieutenant yeah. governor, a very well-known Republican Secretary of State at the state level, not not a foreign, not a State Department secretary. Um, many election officials who have been on the front lines of some of the most contested, controversial local elections think tank leaders, foundation executives, and to a person, they were complaining about how much the GOP has been, and I heard this phrase over and over, taken over by the crazies, end mm -hmm. quote, taken over by the crazy, and how dysfunctional the party has become. Now, I was an outlier because, you know, I fit the, the profile in some ways. I am conservative in some ways. You know, my self-described label, as we've talked about before, is I'm a Burkean progressive, so I, I believe in many conservative principles, but I also believe in, in much, or not not much, but some of the pro progressive agenda. So, uh, But I haven't been an actual member of the Republican Party for quite some time. And so I was something of an outsider. And I lo I've learned as a consultant, David, that the value of an outsider when coming into a troubled institution, which is what I am what I do professionally, is that the value of an outsider in a troubled institution is to ask the dumb question. And the dumb question that I finally posed on the last day of the conference was, guys, why don't you just go? I mean, if the party has been taken over by the crazy, if it's as dysfunctional, as weak as you said, why are you still staying? And the reaction was really interesting. 
Uh, there was a lot of silence in the room. It was a bit of a like turd in the punch bowl effect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and but but people were musing. They were they were silent. They were like and several people said, well, that's a good question. And several people said, I think maybe I need to ask that question more seriously. Some were provided a, a, a decent answer to that question. And then some were a little defensive. Uh, but there was a lot of it, a lot of angst and confusion. I realized that question, should you stay or should you go, touched a nerve. And it was emotionally that same nerve that we touched when we posed that question, should I stay or should I go, the evangelical church version. Yeah. So I realized we're, we're, we're on to something here. And that's when I called you up, David, and said, David, we need to talk about this. Yeah. So David, the first question I want to pose to you is why does this question, should I stay or should I go, the GOP, why does this question actually matter for everyone, not just for the Republicans who are still wrestling with this question uh, in, wh while they're staying in the party, but really for anyone who's already left and also, frankly, for Democrats or for, for people who are not aligned politically? Why should they care about how Republicans wrestle with this question, should I stay or should I go? Yeah, I mean, watching it happen is a learning exercise for one thing. In other words, like watching how a large group of people respond to, especially a large group of people where a very high percentage of them claim a very strong faith identity yeah. and watching how a large group of people wrestles through a challenge to their traditionally expressed morality yeah. when that traditionally expressed morality carries with it a real cost is I think important um, because you can learn, uh, you'll learn positive things, you'll learn negative things, and then you'll also hopefully, you know, even if you're well outside the Republican Party, hopefully you can absorb some lessons that will prick in your mind, in your heart, in your conscience, not if, but when you face conflicts yeah. between different aspects of your identity. Um, and I, that's actually what we're dealing with here is conflicts between different aspects of our identity in many ways. I envision, I see myself um, as a, you know, uh, we all have different parts of our identity, husband, father, Republican, um, boss, employee, yeah. Christian, you know, not necessarily in all that order, but what we begin to find out when different kinds of identities come into conflict with each other, we, that, is, that is only and then and only then do we learn where our true hierarchy of values lies. Not in the abstract, yeah. but in the concrete. That's when we learn. Okay, so it's a relevant question because it has relevant lessons for us in any other sphere of our life as yeah. well where there's conflict of identities. But I want you to elevate up to at the sort of political social analysis, does this question and how Republicans answer this question have real political effects for the rest of us? And here's oh, why I think, right? Because I, it seems to me like if as a non-Republican or even as a Democrat, it is to my interest that the Republican Party is healthy, that it is not taken over by the crazies. Uh, so speak more about yeah. how po even politically there's a, there are stakes at us for all of us on how Republicans answer this question, should I stay or should I go? The absolute worst thing that I think your partisanship, or one of the terrible things, I'm not going to say absolute worst, <laughs> one of the terrible things that your partisanship, a very committed partisanship can lead you to, is to cheering the dysfunction mm. of your opposing of the opposing party because you believe that the dysfunction of the opposing party might make it more likely for you to win when the reality is in a divided nation where there are two parties the an unhealthy party if that is the only other option that voters can choose when they want to send your your party a message and even if you think and you're convicted, uh, convinced to the, the core of your bone marrow <laughs> that your party is not as dysfunctional as the other party, that your party has higher integrity than the other party, your party is not infallible, and it's going to oversee some negative events. And it might be responsible for some negative developments, 
And you know what? The only way to hold them hold you accountable is by voting for the other party. And if the other party is going to be a disaster, then you're cheering on or you're sort of looking at what sort of, you know, gawking at what's happening like you're walking into a zoo or something and you're seeing two animals <laughs> fight each other uh, is unhelpful it is unhelpful because we need two healthy parties yeah and the definition of healthy is not agrees with you yeah um you know the definition of healthy is much more thoughtful are they thoughtful are uh, are they seeking the common good are you know, do they have integrity? You know, yeah. these these are the, the key questions. Do they tolerate potential disagreement and dissent? Uh, mm -hmm. Do they subscribe to our our social compact around the Constitution? Right. I mean, right. right. These are th that those are these would be basic definitions of healthy. Very basic. And if the other part, let's just speak very explicitly. If you are a Democrat and you're cheering on the dysfunction, the undemocratic, to, you know, authoritarian impulses in the Republican Party, saying yeah, because we're going to more likely win an election. I think what you're saying is, you know, you may lose an election because your party may screw it up somehow, and then you're going to be saddled with, or at least you're going to face every four years, an incredibly tense election where oh. stakes are so high because if you lose, you're handing things over to the crazies. Right? Yeah, I mean, look— we shouldn't even have to explain this, to be <laughs> but we honest, kind of do. <laughs> because 2016, you know, there yeah. were a lot yeah. of Democrats who were quite happy that Donald Trump won the nomination in 2016. And believe it or not, there will be Democrats. There are Democrats. I have spoken to them who are already sort of rubbing their hands together in glee at the thought of taking on Trump in 2024. And now I agree with them that Trump is easier to beat than maybe you know any number of other republican politicians i agree with them on that but what are the consequences yeah of a loss to donald trump i mean can we not think through that and and look many democrats have been playing with fire there was a lot of funding that flowed to some That's very right. far right candidates in 2022 Sort of who to who mess the, with who them. defeated the anti-Trump uh, candidate yes. uh, uh, representatives who voted for the impeachment of Trump they were defeated in primary because Democratic activists funded a Trump Trumpian opponent right so yeah and now they dodged that bullet in 2022 and this is what's scary to me is they actually dodged the bullet because all of the hyper far right MAGA Trumpies that they that they poured money into actually lost ultimately right. in the general election. So there's a lot of people walking around saying, oh, we got all this criticism, but look, it worked. Um, no, you just played with fire and for right. once didn't get burned. That's all that happened there. So yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I have seen Democrats sort of point and laugh in, in years, in a year or two ago at say Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah. Ha ha ha, look. The Republicans voted, actually put somebody in Congress who believes in Jewish space lasers, you know, and now nobody's really laughing at her because she's a very powerful member of Congress, not so much because of her formal position, but because of the position she has in the grassroots. And what's one of the reasons why she has that position in the grassroots? Because so many people on the left pointed and laughed at her. That's yeah. how dysfunctional things are, that uh, all it takes in some Republican circles Again, not everywhere, but some Republican circles for someone to start to become really popular is if they're mocked or derided by the other side, yeah. not whether they have natural gifts, political, you know, where they have character, integrity, natural, natural political gifts. But if the libs don't like them, I must. And, yeah. it, you know, that kind of, um, you know, that we, I think people just need to be aware of the dynamic and the dynamic right now is that the more the left comes down on somebody on the right, the more the right rallies to that person. Yeah. All right. So we all, every one of us needs to pay attention to this question. Should I stay or should I go the GOP version? Because it matters. It has lessons for us personally in our own context, even in our non-political context, that essential moral question is going to be one that we may likely face. So we should draw some lessons from this. And two, what we're saying is politically, it is in everyone's interest that how people answer this question points 
to the direction of a healthy Republican Party or, or some other more healthy scenario than what we have right now. So we need to make sense to make sense of the world. We need to make sense of this question. Should I stay or should I go? And David, when people ask me to help them make sense of something, I often do not have a prescriptive answer for them. What I prescribe for them often is a metaphor. I'm the metaphor doctor. So I'm here to prescribe <laughs> metaphors. And so here's my prescription of a metaphor to make sense of this question. Here's the metaphor. Imagine that you are a member of a ship traveling across the ocean and you are attacked by pirates. Okay, so the ship is your institution, whether it's the GOP, the evangelical church, or some other local institution, and you are being attacked by pirates, people who are wanting to take over your institution with a form of identity that is a corrupt, evil version of the original institution. They want to fly the pirate flag by take and take over your institution. So what are your options when you are being overtaken by pirates? Well, I believe you have three main options. And I'm gonna explain one of them and I want you to break it down each one of these in the GOP <laughs> version, but I first wanna illustrate each of these three versions. So here's the three options you have. You can leave, option number one, leave. Option number two, you can stand, okay, stand. Option number three, you can hide. Leave, stand, hide. Those are your three options. And for you social science nerds, you may hear some echoes of this from a classic book by the economist Albert Hirschman. It was a book called Exit Voice Loyalty. Those were his three options. My version is leave, stand, hide. But these are the basic three options that Hirschman outlined when you are a member and you are dissatisfied with your institution. So leave, stand, hide. So now quick preview. Among leave, stand, and hide, I believe two of those options, leave and stand, have a chance of success. But it totally depends on how you exercise those options of leave and stand. The third option, hide, <laughs> almost never succeeds. And we'll talk about why. <laughs> All right. So let me start with leave. So, so here's a scenario. It looks like the pirates are going to win. They've taken over the rigging. They've taken over the foredeck. And, and you just, maybe you feel like they're about to win or you just can't stand fighting anymore. Like you're just not a fighter, okay? It, in that situation, it is a legitimate option, in my belief, to leave, to leave the institution, to leave the ship. But it ma how you leave matters greatly. If you jump ship alone, your chances of surviving are slim because an institution <laughs> is like a ship. We can only make it through the ocean of life when we have regular structure, partnership with others, durability, shared resources to make it through a long, hard journey. That's what institutions do. This is why I believe God made us to reflect him institutionally as well, because we only can only make it through kind of the hard things in life when we're together and institutions bring us together. So to suddenly jump ship and leave an institution and try to survive utterly alone is like jumping into the ocean alone. Maybe you can grab a, a, a broken spar here or a casket here, and you can tread water for a little bit, but you will not make it for very long. You need others for support, encouragement, shared resources, and especially because you have now jumped ship in the middle of an ocean, you're disoriented. You need others to make sense of this new world, to figure out a new course, which is why your best chance of success, if you are going to leave, is to find a lifeboat. Like find a little other institution, a little other organization where you can gather with others and you can fly your own flag, like fly the true flag so that other individuals who are treading water, flailing about alone in this ocean, others who have jumped ship, can find a spot on the horizon to rally to, to swim towards and cling to. And together then you guys can shake off, shake off the, 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 the debris and damage and try to chart a new course, an unknown course, but a new course. And just to illustrate this in the evangelical church context, this is why David, even after you left for the, for the, for the New York times, I felt called to keep the good faith going because the Good Faith Podcast is an example of a lifeboat. It's right. not anybody's final destination. This is not, we're not an institution, long-term institution. We're a lifeboat. Uh, so the other, you know, the non-nautical analogy I've used is we're a campfire. 
for folks who are lost and wandering through the wilderness to gather around and together make sense of the world. The, the nautical version of the campfire, of the Good Faith Campfire, is a lifeboat, and we need lifeboats. So David, take that leave option and take that metaphor, apply it to the GOP. How are people who have left the GOP or considering being the GOP, how are they leaving? Yeah. So I think that um, the way you describe leaving as sort of finding a lifeboat and putting a flag on it is actually a form of fighting. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a form of fighting. Um, right. And so, you know, that is the kind of leaving that I think is um, that form of leaving to me. In other words, what you might want to call it is sort of a, a fighting withdrawal, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. is – the way in which many times causes are preserved, yeah. actually. Uh, and so, yeah, when I, when I think of leaving. Well, and you did that. You did that with the dispatch. Oh, yeah. that, was, that was the lifeboat you guys created, right? Yes. And, yeah. and the Good Faith Podcast was part of the bigger yeah. dispatch lifeboat, yeah. right? And so that's what we did is, you know, Jonah and Steve and me and the rest of the, uh, of the folks – the, you know, the dissenters who started the dispatch is we, we didn't want to just sort of say, it's not just the Republican Party, but larger right-wing media is a dumpster fire. We wanted to put together an alternative institution. Yeah. Um, because I think one of the core, core ways you combat a drift in values is by upholding the values you want to see, by modeling the values you want to see in politics and life, et cetera. And so if right-wing media was a dumpster fire, could you make a better version of it? Could you make a better, um, could you show what right, you know, what conservative leading media could be? And so that was a big part of what we tried to do with the dispatch, but I could not agree more that the last thing you wanna do is sort of quiet quitting or ghosting the GOP. And I don't necessarily think, you know, a lot of us are not in a position where there are other lifeboats close by. I mean, you can sort of find them on the internet. You can listen to this podcast, for example. You can subscribe to The Dispatch. You can, you know, read me at the Times. You can do all kinds of things. But as far as like your your own local community, often it's really, really, really hard. Um, but at the same time, I think there is a real value in not quiet quitting. Um, and because you know what what ends up happening when you quiet quit, especially in a world in which uh, it often seems as if the most extreme voices feel completely uninhibited in speaking, yeah. and you might feel intimidated, and also in sort of this world where large numbers of people come and go from parties for all kinds of different reasons, is by stating what you're doing and why. Even in a small community, even in a, in a situation where you don't necessarily have a public platform beyond your own social media, what you're doing is it's still a form of fighting. And yeah. it's, a, it's a form of fighting, especially in a political structure where quitting is its own form of voting in a way, where walking away from a party is its own form of voting. It's, it's your own form of citizen activism. And I think in that circumstance, by saying what you're doing and why you're doing it, you are providing a degree of accountability. Because goodness knows, the uh, pirates are not quiet at all. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> right. There is nothing quiet about a, the, you know, the Jolly Roger. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, pirates tend to be loud. And, and you know, I think one of the problems that we have, and I've used this illustration uh, t uh, many times, is it's that Homer Simpson GIF problem yeah. where your eyes get wide and you back into the shrubbery. And there's a million reasons why people do that that are very human and super understandable. Like, it's just hard to have these kinds of toxic conversations. But at the same time, I think when you openly declare why you're leaving, what you're doing is nothing like a surrender. Yeah. It's a different form of fighting. It's a refusal to consent to, it's a refusal to um, consent to being a part of an organization that yeah. you believe is going astray and critically explaining why that is. David, 
explain why we have seen so few examples of this lifeboat option, of this fighting withdrawal, of this declaration of exit in a collective organized fashion. I mean, we've seen some individual versions of it, but you know, other than I think of the dis dispatch, I thought briefly for a moment there back in, um, whenever they started, I uh, can't remember when it was, the Lincoln Project, I thought that might've been maybe a form, but that felt like that, that was more of an ad campaign than it was an actual organized, you know, institutional lifeboat. Yeah, that's life not vote. a model, right. Yeah, that's not a model, right? So mm -hmm. what? why have so few Republicans who have left, why have they, there's, there's so few examples we can point of the lifeboat option? Yeah, boy, that's a really good question and for which I believe there are multiple answers. Um, for some people, for some people, and again, these are going to be sort of buckets, different buckets of people. So here's, here's a bucket. Bucket, one bucket is at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they're just a Republican. Like that's in the hierarchy of values, sort of how they see themselves. Who am I? I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican. And why am I a Republican? Well, because Republicans are not Democrats. And sort of the, the least justifiable version of this is sort of the purely identity base. That's just, I'm a Republican, you know? That's, <laughs> and the most defensible aspect of it is, well, there are a lot of things about the Democrats that I object to um, for reasonable reasons. And the only vehicle that exists for tangibly objecting to the Democratic Party is the Republican Party. Um, and so therefore, as uncomfortable as I might be right now, or as, as um, dissatisfied as I might be right now, what, what this Republican is right now still has one thing going for it and it, that it's not the Democratic Party. Right. And that, that's negative polarization. And, and we can unpack that as sort of a separate phenomenon and how yep. that can lead you into dark, dark places. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the you know so there's this identity bucket right that's I'm a Republican right but just to be clear David what the question I'm asking is I'm talking about the people who have left those are people who have stayed oh, okay. I'm talking about people okay. who have left why have they not formed smaller lifeboats why have they generally in my impression why have they jumped into the waters alone grabbed some spar and you know casket and tried to just make it make it by themselves why has there not been well, more collective organized leaving. Yeah, so that's okay. So that, sorry, <laughs> I <laughs> that's was right. answering the different question. Okay, <laughs> so that's a really that's a really good question. So one, look, there's a lot of fear if you're doing anything mm. other than quiet mm. quitting. There are consequences. Right. Okay, that's so right. <laughs> the the you, pirates see that flag and they're going <laughs> to actually aim a cannon after you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it is so much easier just as on a relational basis on a social basis, especially if you live in a really red area, yeah. to just keep your sneak mouth away. shut, yeah. sneak away. Maybe you're going to vote for an independent or maybe you're going to vote for a Democrat instead of a Republican and you're going to do it in quietly because there's a lot of disincentives towards speaking up. I, an enormous number of people, uh, there, there's an enormous number of people, especially in the hyper-mobilized right, who, who inflict, intentionally inflict real yeah. costs. Okay. Right. So that's that's fear, and it's understandable fear. I think there's a difference between understandable fear and justify and and a response to that fear that I don't think is necessarily justifiable, even if I understand it. But there's fear. The other thing is just to be honest, Curtis, um, ignorance, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. People just don't know that there are other people who feel the same mm. way. Right, because there aren't actually um, a lot of institutions on the right that you can look to as waving a flag. And as much right. as you know, as much success as the dispatch has had, and it's had a ton of success, it was way above our projections. Curtis to become a nationally known by rank and file by the tens of millions of people media platform takes time yeah it takes a lot of time yeah and so time and time again i run into people who have this kind of uh story that they tell me and they'll say you know i i haven't really felt like a republican to, since 2016 and i felt alone until i found you last yeah. month 
Right. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> I've been out there. I, I've been out here. I've been waving I've been, my flag. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. I'm just one small voice in a really big country. So, so there's the fear piece, and then there's the ignorance piece. People don't know where to go. It's yeah. they don't know who to attach to. Um, so I think that those two, the the ignorance piece of it is the one that in many ways is grieves me the most because I feel like we would have bigger and bigger lifeboats. Yeah. We could quickly have bigger and bigger lifeboats. We could have um, bigger, larger and larger communities yeah. where people don't feel so alone or feel so yeah. isolated. Um, the ignorance part really grieves me. The fear part. I understand, I understand it, but I just don't think it's justifiable. Yeah. Um, the other part, the, the ignorance part, it sort of just demonstrates, Curtis, the sad reality of how small our lifeboats are. Yeah. Yeah. So let me inject a pastoral wor wor word here, and then we're going to take a quick break. Uh, pastoral wor word from, from Pastor Curtis here. If you're leaving... <laughs> If you're leaving the GOP, or frankly any other institution, but let's we're talking about the GOP, try to find someone else. Try to find others who are like-minded. I understand maybe you feel like you can't be the one to raise the flag and you know cobble together in a little mini lifeboat, a little mini institution. But minimally find others who you can cling onto your little debris with, your little broken spar with, because you won't make it very well alone even if it's two or three people even if somebody that you know and, and this is gonna this may if you don't if you want if you don't want to wave the flag this might mean okay you keep a low profile but you're you're scanning the horizon you're trying to find mm -hmm. other folks who are in the water with you and then swim to them swim to each other and find create a regular break a breakfast a, a monthly gathering something so that you are not alone because you need each other if you're going to be if, if you're a lever and you and you don't have an institution, you at least need each other um, in, in small groups. So make that a priority. If you have left or you are thinking about leaving, try to leave with others. All right. So we've been discussing how to leave with a chance of success, with a chance of finding other people, either finding a lifeboat or just finding other people to cling to in the process of leaving. So I want to go to the second of the three options. Remember, the three options are leave, stand, or hide. Uh, second option stand. So this option is where you say, you know, darn it, this is my boat. And I, 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 this, I'm the true member and flag bearer of this institution. I'm going to stand, make a stand. I'm going to fight it out. I'm going to defend the ship and this institution under threat. Now, just to be clear, as a Christian, this stand that you make is a fundamentally a spiritual stand. It is not a physical fight. Uh, as Paul says, our enemies are not ultimately of flesh and blood. We are standing, as the Ephesians 6, 12 says, we are standing against the dark powers of darkness behind the pirates. And by the way, that, that doesn't mean just in the woo-hoo-hoo invisible spiritual realm. Ephesians emphasizes that this stand that we take against the dark powers, it usually takes place in institutional context. It is against the rulers, the authorities, the dominions, which is biblical language for concrete institutions. So Ephesians is depicting there may be a chance time when you are called to make a stand against the dark powers behind the pirates, and that's going to be in the context of rulers, dominions, and authorities, of human institutions. Now, here's the thing. How you make a stand is absolutely critical because, once again, if you try to make a stand alone, your chances of, su of success are very low. You will be like one individual on the foredeck surrounded by a mob of pirates and somebody is going to stab you behind the back. Somebody will club you over the head from an unexpected direction and you will not have anybody else there to rely on. So to, if you're going to make a stand, if you're not going to leave, you're going to fight it out and say, this GOP or this evangelical church is belongs to me, uh, then you've got to find others and you've got to stand back to back right? That circle, right? That you imagine where you can see all the threats coming at you and you've got your, your guard up and together make a stand against the powers of darkness. And again, just to illustrate this option of standing, this is the really, David, the rationale for us 
for the after party. If the good faith is the lifeboat option, the after party is the is the stand together, rally, yeah. rally us, form a circle on the foredeck and, and make a call. Because right now, pastors and other leaders who want to stand are left to fight the mob alone for the most part. And the after party is us trying to plant a flag somewhere on the foredeck and say, rally to this point. Let's make a stand here. So that's and then that's that's crucial, crucial if you, for those who feel called to make a stand. Now, David, apply this to the to the GOP, because it seems to me just like I have str I struggled to find an example of somebody who made who made the leave option via the lifeboat. I struggle to find anybody or any expression of the stand option within the GOP that was a collective rally here. Let's circle up that the few expressions I see are, are the individual dissenters who then get crushed by the mob. Is that an accurate reading? Oh, it's extremely accurate, which is why, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about what are some names that I could use as synonyms for standing? Um, Mitting, <laughs> Mitt, Mitt Romney, who was Mitt Romney, by Mitting. Him, Mitting, okay, Mitting, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Mitting, uh, so Mitt Romney was stood by himself to vote to convict Trump yeah. on, yeah. In, in, you know, in the first impeachment. Lizzing, Liz Cheney, <laughs> uh, Adaming, Adam Kinzinger. Adam, oh. So, so there's a very few. Can we do Petering for Peter Mayering, Mayering, uh, Peter Meyering, <laughs> yeah. Meyering, rather? Yeah. Yeah. So, there's very few people who, and you know, by the end of the Trump era, you actually had very small bands. So you had the very small number of Republicans in the House who voted for impeachment. You had the very small number. Of, Dem of Republicans in the Senate who voted for impeachment. Um, but there's there's very few examples. And if you're going to if you're going to show sort of have a small, merry band of people who are making that last stand on the four deck or whatever, it's a small circle. It's an absolute small circle. And and there are reasons why it's such a small circle. And one of the reasons why it's such a small circle is that the early people who came out against Trump, for example, were massacred. I mean, yeah. just demolished. Yeah. Yeah. Their so, head was hung on a spike and displayed for everybody else. Yes. Yeah. So Jeff Flake, for example, um, Bob Corker, for example. Okay, but you David, could, take take those examples, right? Did they really make a stand together with, with in any organization, or did, were they the individual? Uh, there was no fighter. one for them to do it with. Like, yeah. I'm not blaming them. Like, what, yeah. you know, it's like, a, imagine you are, you know, I remember back in 20, late 2015, and I'm kind of having this sort of uh, experience that goes something like this after being a Republican for a very long time. Hey, we're not doing this, are we? Yeah. Are we? Are we? <laughs> are we? And, and you think, you know, you sort of say, uh, you know, imagine a, you know, in World War One, you blow the whistle to lead all your men over the <laughs> right. top and you blow the whistle and you charge out of the trench and you're running and there's machine gun fire and you look for your the rest of your company and they're like back in the trench. And they're like, right. Right. That guy's crazy. That's no <laughs> I'm not going out there. So I don't, I don't blame Jeff Flake for being by himself. I don't blame Bob Corker for being by himself. I don't blame Mitt Romney for being by himself. I mean. The problem well, I don't blame them, but why didn't they convene, organize, and say, let's do this together? Like, imagine how history looks different if, when Hollywood Access tape comes out in 2016, Paul Ryan gathers together with the Liz Cheney, with the P Peter Meyer, with, with everyone else who says, who says, who agrees in their heart, in their true hearts, we're not going to do this. And then actually plants a flag and declares together out loud together we're not going to do this. why well, did that not happen answer. that's an easy answer curtis yeah. the easy answer is there weren't very many fighters and there were a lot of hiders yeah so um you know a mitt romney could have done he could have worked the phones for nine days straight um on everyone who's had a pri he's had a private conversation with about not liking trump and believing trump is unfit and he wasn't going to get one more vote to yeah. convict Trump. I mean, this is this stuff was people. Tr it's not like people didn't try. You know, it's not like people didn't say, are, are you with me? Are you are we going to be in this? And then at the end of the day, 
you would have a lot of people behind closed doors saying, I don't like Trump. I don't like Trump. I don't like Trump. He's a threat to the republic. But then when it came down to the ask, are you going to stand? The answer was absolutely not. Yeah, they were. They, they chose to hide. They chose to hide. Yeah. So if you're yeah. looking at the lack of fighters, I don't in any way, shape or form blame that on the fighters themselves. Sure. I, I am blaming it on the hiders who misled the fighters into thinking they might fight, you know. So a classic, I mean, the perfect example of this is the way in which the Republican electeds went from, I believe you would have had on the night, uh, on, on, at midnight on January 6th, 2021, or right, you know, right around midnight, you might have had a bunch of Republican votes to impeach. If, if there yeah. had been an article of impeachment drafted, ready to vote on right after the election, they voted to certify the election, it might have been very different than even two weeks later or three weeks or a month later because what happened is the people who were tempted towards fighting in the immediate aftermath of that horrific incident were convinced to be hiders again. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that, that's, that's the issue. The issue is that it's not a failure of strategy really by anybody. Yeah. The people who fought would have loved, like, you know, if you look at Mitt, I would, I would urge folks to go back and look at Mitt Romney's speech that he delivered when he was the first yeah, senator speech. Yeah. in American history to vote to convict a president of his own party. And if you look closely, his hands were shaking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what it's like to fight. That's what it's to like. To fight alone, especially. Yeah. 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 So I, I blame the hiders, Curtis, and in because that's that's why we didn't see it. And and I think in many ways the hiders often deceived the fighters Ugh. into thinking that there was going to be more support and then when they stood up it all evaporated. Well, and just to think about why the hiding option is so damaging because not only does it leave the fighters out to dry as you said, but it completely erodes trust for any collective action for virtue in the future, right? Because you cannot yes. act together if you've, if you've if trust is not there. And yeah. that act of, yeah, I'm with you. I'm right behind you, way behind you. Yeah. Um, th that completely erodes trust and almost makes it practically impossible to make a stand together in the future, which is why the hiding option is so, so corrosive. You know, the other thing, David, that I'm, I'm just being made aware of as you speak is this is a great example of why the political future <clears throat> for our country has a spiritual, absolute spiritual component to it. Because like you said, it is not for the absence of strategy. There are plenty of smart people around. What is missing is the spiritual component of courage, of virtue. Mm -hmm. And there's just no substitute for, for that. You can't strategize your way around that. You can't maneuver or finesse your way around that essential spiritual, and I mean spiritual in a broad sense of that word, the spiritual quality of cur courage, which as you have said, is really just virtue under test. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And you know, I think this is a great segue into the hiders. Yeah. Um, because I don't think you can understand this moment until you really truly understand the hiders. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that is the group because it's by far the biggest. Yep. Yep. By far. Um people ask me, why did so many evangelicals vote for Trump? And the the quickest, shortest answer to that is because they're Republicans and Trump was the Republican nominee. Yeah. End of explanation, right? <laughs> right, right. And, and so, yeah, I think the hiders, to me, is that's the most interesting population. It's yeah. e it's actually easier for me to understand in many ways the fighters and the leavers, and to understand why people that make those different choices, why someone does like Mitt de did and stay in the GOP, and fight, and try to cleanse the GOP of a corrupt president. Versus what I did, which was in a very different position, I'm not a senator, to publicly declare independence from the GOP yeah. and from any political party at all yeah, and do that from when the context of being an opinion journalist, a columnist. Those are different positions with different kinds of roles in our culture 
And so I, I can understand both of those decisions much easier than I can understand the hider. And the hider, to be clear, I do not categorize a hider as a MAGA person. Like that's that that's yeah, right. The, the hider, the hider is somebody who is against the pirates. That right. deep down, they 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 do not want the pirates there. They want the pirates gone. Mm -hmm. But their rationale, and let's let's break open because let's try to make it yes. under, more understandable. This rationale, I think their rational and emotional rationale is, if I make myself a target, if I leave by plant with by planting a flag on a lifeboat, I'm going to be a target. They're going to shoot a cannon at me. If I make a stand on the foredeck, I'm definitely going to get massacred by the by the, you know, the mob, right? So I'm going to hide, and I think the justification is so. Let's just let's just name it for what it is. The emotion is fear, it's mm -hmm. self protectiveness. That's just that's just what the emotion is. It's and the rationale is, if you make yourself a target, uh, if you if you stand up, you'll make yourself a target. That's the sort of strategic rationale, and then the. The, the story they are telling themselves is if I, I can outweigh them, I yeah. can, if I hide long enough, they will leave and I will get my <laughs> ship back. I think that's the story, right? That, that whether, whether or not they have really looked at it, like and analyzed that story, that's the, that's the unconscious story they're telling myself. If I hide, stay hidden long enough, the pirates will leave. I will get my ship back. David, yeah. how realistic is that as a narrative? <laughs> it's it's actually unreal. You, it's not only is it unrealistic by hiding, you're making it more unrealistic. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, just to continue with the, I'm just having so much fun with these various metaphors. If I hide in here long enough, the pirates will get scurvy. <laughs> 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 and then I'll be able to retake the ship. You know, That's right. The, um, a, I, I will, and just think about that logic. I will take over a scurvy ridden infested ship would be your best case scenario in that case. So, Well, I think that's fine because scurvy isn't like a communicable disease. I think it's just, you're, you're hiding. It's a lack of, no, no, it would be more like yeah. typhoid or the, yeah, the plague. Yeah. Maybe it'd yeah. be a better analogy. I'm hiding with all the lemon juice. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, I think the hiding issue is is really the heart of it. It's really the heart of it. And and part of it is justified by what I would call the prudential justification. So the prudential okay. justification is I am I see what's happened to the levers. They're out there on these very small institutions. They have not built a competing, a truly competing institution to the GOP. Mm -hmm. I see what happens to the fighters because I step over their mutilated remains <laughs> on the deck. Oh, I love how grisly our metaphorical uh, <laughs> riffing here is getting. So, <laughs> but I also don't think that the pirates can sustain themselves. They will right. burn themselves out, and yes. so therefore, somebody's got to be still here. And right. the only way to be still here in any sort of viable way is this yes. hiding strategy. And that's that's what I would call a sort of the prudential silence kind of analysis, um, which actually, when you articulate it out loud, can seem kind of compelling. You you say this this only has a limited shelf life. Um, it's going to burn itself out. In the meantime, I will be there to pick up the root pieces, and I will not have burned bridges. Liz right. Cheney, no one's going to call Liz Cheney back to the party. You know, no right. one's going to demand to nominate Nitt again for president. But me, me, I haven't hurt anyone's feelings in the right. party. I've been the loyal soldier, and I'll be the one to pick up the pieces. And that presuming you know, I, there's a number of things wrong with that. Let me let me highlight two of them real quick. One is it presumes you're able to maintain your own virtue while you stay on the boat. That's right. And and over time has not been kind to that thesis, shall That's we right. say. Yes. Um, there's an awful lot of people who assured me that they were stayers but would never buy into MAGA, who were the third bass boat in the boat parade by 2020. Yeah, um, yeah. The other thing is um, wait. Just pause it, for for a moment. Pause on that one for a moment because I think that's really important to underline. That when you hide, you are being formed spiritually. 
that's a, mm-hmm. that is a, uh, we form ourselves spiritually by the actions we take. And when we hide, there's a spiritual formation going on. There's, you are, your, your spirit of courage is getting drained as that, because to hide, you have to practice hiding. You have to actually practice like, oh, I see a threat. I'm going to duck my head. That forms you over time, the more you have to adopt that habit. So another way to put it is, yes, maybe at some point the pirates will get bored or will will, will just feel like they've run out, they've burned out and they will leave. But when they leave, they will have already taken something and they will have taken it from you, the hider. And that thing that they've taken is your courage. They yeah. will have left the ship with that, with that. So Timi- you- Timidity is habit forming. And then so, so even if in this dream scenario, you can inherit uh, the, the, the ship after the pirates have left, you are in no position to fight the next pirate that comes sweeping over the horizon because your own courage has been drained from you by a long formational experience of hiding. The other prudent, the other form of sort of what you might call the prudential hide argument is what I was talking about when I was answering the wrong question, which is as bad as these pirates are, they're yeah. not as bad as those other pirates <laughs> over right. there. And yeah. so I'm going to join with the thieving and plundering pirates to stop the cannibal pirates. Right? Or, you know. <laughs> and so, and so that's team lesser evil. So that's team lesser that. evil. Yes. Okay. So, you know, I really preferred my, Royal Navy ship in the, of the line that I was on, but yeah. pirates have come and taken it, and, but the cannibal pirates are still out there, so we've got to sail out to meet them together as much as I don't like that. And that's the sort of team lesser evil argument. And the problem with the team lesser evil argument is it actually, frankly, doesn't work without corrupting you. Yeah. And, and here's how it corrupts you. I have never in my life met somebody who can sustain feeling as if they're evil of any degree. Yeah. And in other words, if so, in other words, you don't run around saying about yourself, I'm part of team lesser evil. That's yeah. a bad chant. Lesser evil, lesser <laughs> evil. Yes. And so we just don't want to be evil. So there's two ways that we really deal with that. One, the best way is repentance. If I have embraced evil, if I've irrationalized evil, even if it's a lesser evil, I should repent. Yeah. And I should embrace virtue, embrace what's right and what's good. Okay, that's one way. The other way is to say, you know what? Actually, this isn't lesser evil. It's actually quite good. And this is what you saw in that transition from, you know, uh, that that I'm going to hold my nose to vote for Trump to third, ba- you know, third boat in the in the boat parade was that, oh, actually, this is okay. No way, yeah. actually, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And Isaiah had a lot to say about that. Like Isaiah- Oh, oh 5, David, bring Isaiah, I love it. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good mm. and good evil. Preach it. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And, and this is what you saw, Curtis, this is what really grieves me about a lot of what happened on the right is they began to call evil good and good evil. Yeah. And, you know, we just saw this big example of this when Tucker was fired. Right. When Tucker Carlson was fired, a large number of Christian voices came out in support of him in emphatic ways, emphatic, without any mention of his lying, without any mention of his malice, none of that. None of that because they saw Tucker as a very effective warrior against what they perceived as this greater evil. And then over time, they began to just admire Tucker Carlson in full as evil as he often was in his expression, in his character, in the way that he treated fellow human beings created in the image of God. It was often vile and yet. Christians were wrapping both arms around him. Yeah. And so this is what happens when, so the two prudential, I'll wait it out. We're not really great at that, or it's all lesser evil. We're not really great at that either. And what you end up doing is empowering the very pirates who've seized the ship. 
all of what you said is completely biblically true, logically true, and just to underline it, it is historically true. <laughs> if you look at every tr truly evil regime that has risen to power, they have risen to power on the backs of that particular logic that you have said. Either people who disagreed with them thought, ah, oh, they're not uh, Hitler, man. I don't know. I don't know if I can go along with it. But he's better than better than the other guy, either the team lesser evil thing, or I will wait it out and I, and you know I'll pick up the pieces after after he's gone. Hitler, Pol Pot. I mean, any authoritarian totalitarian regime ri rises to power because there's a mass of hiders who adopt exactly that language, that, that, that logic. And invariably, what you see is those very people, they become corrupted themselves. They come to not just wait it out, hide it out. They become supporters. They become reformed and reshaped by the very evil they were trying to hide away from and wait out. Uh, this is, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading about the Weimar Republic and especially about the church, the Christian German church in the Weimar Republic. And that is the logic you see over and over and over again. They, they generally were, they, they found Hitler distasteful. Uh, these are, they found him both for spiritual and for class reasons. They viewed him as this sort of young uh, or kind of rash, um, kind of uh, from the streets brawler, but they're like, you know what? We can use him. Uh, or you know, they, this, can't, uh, this can't last forever. And eventually by the end, they were complete supporters of the Nazi regime. They had become Nazis themselves. Well, you know, the, let's let's just pit, put a pin in that historical piece of it because let's remember that a lot there was a lot of friendliness towards early versions of fascism yeah. in the West. Yeah. Uh, until until Hitler made all of his aggression completely, painfully, genocidally known. There was a surprising amount of sympathy for fascism in a lot of quarters in the yep. in the West, and some of it, to be sure, was ab was rooted in anti-Semitism. Some of it was rooted in anti-communism. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, what you began to see happen in part of the West was you were seeing the monstrosity of Soviet communism, and it was a monstrosity. It was an an anti-life, anti-human, genocidal ideology that has the blood of tens of millions on its hands. So if there was ever a great evil, atheistic, uh, you know, that, that, that fundamentally atheistic, genocidal uh, uh, communism that was, and I, I'm, to be very clear, I'm not saying that atheistic and genocidal flow from one to the other. <laughs> right, right. But I'm saying that what you had was, especially if you were a Christian person on the West, yeah. was this genocidal communist expansionist empire. Right. And how are you going to fight it? Well, here comes team lesser evil. Yeah. You know, so you had the red shirts and then you had the brown shirts. Yeah. But then it turned out that over time, team lesser evil was not all that lesser evil. Was team it? was greater evil in it many, many ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ultimate evil. It <laughs> ultimate was team evil. Ultimate yeah. evil. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, it's you can be drawn into these highly tactical, highly pragmatic decisions by the existence of what you perceive to be overriding evil. Yeah. And you can be drawn into these what you believe to be tactical or or, or or uh, temporary kinds of alliances and where you sacrifice a lot of things that you would never imagine sacrificing in face of this looming threat. And then you fast forward the clock a few weeks, months, years, and you won't recognize yourself anymore. That's right. And just to be clear, I want to state this. It has become kind of a, a standard protocol that whenever you use the Nazi or Nazi example historically, you have to say, now I'm not saying blank right. example are the same thing as Nazis. So I suppose I could, we can insert that standard caveat. But what I want to say is, no, actually the same psychological and spiritual dynamics are in play. You know, it's not the, the actual evil on the street certainly is not as bad as the Nazis, but the same psychological and spiritual moves and rationale and justification that led to the Nazi party are right now in play, both in the evangelical church and in the GOP. And that that's the danger.
Well, and we can go to other historical analogies. I mean, I've used the Sunni Shia civil war yeah. in Iraq as an example of how a community animated by grievance can become quite uh, aggressive. Yeah. And sometimes those grievances are real, and then sometimes those grievances are manufactured or conspiratorial. But there are, you know, let me put it this way, Curtis. I am less inclined to sort of say, I'm not saying this or that after January 6th. That's right. Exactly. Like, yeah. Like, let's just be clear because <laughs> yeah, yeah. if you had told me, I, heck, in December, I was writing warning of violence. Right. Okay. So I, I saw violence coming. I mean, you, you actually had to have your head in the sand not to see violence coming with all of this rhetoric. But even seeing violence coming, I did not see the breaching and the storming of the United yeah. States Capitol. That yeah. that was beyond something. So I'm I'm at the point where I'm I'm highly hopeful that a lot of these darker historical analogies won't ultimately play out here. But I'm no longer anything remotely approaching yeah. certain. Yeah. And I think if you are certain, you're if you are certain, you're probably right. Okay, you're probably right. But there's a big difference between being probably right and certainly right. And and we need to we need to drill down on some of these historical analogies. So David, let's head to the home stretch here by trying to get a little more pastoral and practical. I think we've done a lot of great analysis, but I especially want to talk to <coughs> excuse me. I want to talk to the hiders, those who either self-identify uh, and are, as we have been talking about, have some uncomfortable, and I'm sure it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable stab of recognition of saying, yeah, something, maybe not totally, but something of that spiritual spirituality, of that narrative logic that, I, that you've been describing of the hiders, that's been playing out in my, in my head and heart. David, what would you say to those people as they are coming to some dim starting recognition? Yeah, I've been a hider. What's their first step? I think the first step is actually repentance. Um, and, and to say repentance is not to say, I'm standing here condemning you um, or that I don't understand your choice, right? Um, I understand it. I sympathize with it. I, imp I, I understand it completely. I know what it is like to make a different choice and it can be really hard and tough. So I, I completely get it. I understand it. But like many things that we make where we make an understandable wrong decision, the way in which you achieve lasting change is by repenting of the wrong decision. So I would say that the first step is, is to repent. And then the second step is to, I think, confess. So, and here's where I think confessing. In other words, I, here's what I believed. I no longer believe it, and here's why. Or here's what I did. I no longer believe that was right, yeah. and here's why. Yeah. Um, so I think, one, it's very good for your soul. I mean, again, all this is like nothing about this is original to me here. Like this is just <laughs> sort of I think, Christianity. I think, I think the, the Bible, Bible might like, yeah, like, have something yeah, to say about this formula that you're for articulating. It's good for your soul to confess. <laughs> it's good for you. It's good for you. But, David, get but, even more practical. I'm talking about an actual – but but I'm I'm talking about so like an actual person in your community, say in Tennessee, who recognizes, yep, I've been a hider. What would it look like for them to repent and confess practically? Do they do they do this with somebody else? Do they do this with, oh, I would just by themselves? Do they? You can yeah. take something like a recent news event, like yeah. the ejection from the Tennessee House of two Tennessee representatives, and say, I've been meaning to say something like this for some time. But I'm done. Or if you want to be a fighter, I'm done. I'm done. I, I, I'm, I refuse to consent to this yeah. as a Republican. Yeah. I have in the past. That was wrong. I refuse. So yeah. from this point forward, I am not going to vote for people who, for example, voted, who unrepentantly voted to overturn the election or yeah. who voted to expel these members of the House. I'm just not going to do it, or I'm not yeah. part of this party. And so I think that there's abundant opportunities to tell friends, to tell families, to tell whoever follows you on social media, 
I'm done. I'm out. No more. I'm either going to take my stand on the foredeck or I'm heading to that other flag over there. And, right. and I think that that is, um, I think that's a, a very important moment. And it also has real practical application Yeah. because how many times do you hear, do I hear, I thought I was alone. Yep. I thought I was going crazy. I thought I was the only person. And believe me, when you finally do decide to plant the flag or to stand on the foredeck, it's going to, you'll get incoming, but you're also going to have, you're going to also see that you're going to join or be a part of a community that you may not, or even form a community that you didn't know could exist. Yeah. So one practical way, I didn't intend this to be a promo for Redeeming Babel, but go to Redeeming Babel, subscribe now so that you can get updates of the after party. That's, that is going to be an effort that David Russell Moore and I are, it's a rally the around the flag uh, exercise uh, uh, effort, a project. And so please uh, come find out more about it, find out ways that you can be involved as this project uh, unfolds. So that's one way you can, you can make a stand is uh, su subscribe now and share that with others, share the news about this project with others, share the news of uh, the good faith podcast. If this is a lifeboat, so tell others about this lifeboat uh, as a way for you to gather with others to make sense of this new world in which you are no longer being a hider. Uh, please consider uh, promoting this podcast, put it on your social media, share it with others or other examples. This is, I'm just offering the ones that we have, that we have. There may be others that you know about that are, are expressions of the leave or stand option Go public with it, even in your own small little world, even with a small circle of friends. Uh, don't do this. Don't hide in private on this. And and I really like, David, by the way, uh, I really like this actual intentional action of, confess of, of confession that is part of repentance. I would really suggest to you, if you feel convicted by anything that you've heard, that you've been a hider, um, find someone, like an actual person who you know will be compassionate understanding and is rooted in the gospel, the gospel of forgiveness and make a confession, uh, make a confession and receive from that person forgiveness from God th through that person, through that confession. Um, and uh, we are all in constant need of repentance, confession and forgiveness. That is the life cycle of a Christian. And so this, our political lives are no different in our need for that. David, this has been a fantastic conversation. Any final words you have for the people? <laughs> no, I just am all in on more podcasts with involving 18th and 17th century nautical metaphors. Yeah. <laughs> naval combat metaphors. Yeah. Like I'm all about it. Well, if you want more uh, nautical metaphors or other kinds of metaphors, come I'm the I'm the metaphor doctor and David uh, is my partner in all things uh, military, military, military metaphor. Um, so uh, come back once again next week to the Good Faith Podcast, where once again, you're not going to be alone. We'll gather around the campfire.